the one and only Mike Jones. Mike, welcome back to the mother of all talk shows. Let's start with that point. Uh, are you still as well received in Moscow society as you've ever been in the long time now that you've been living there? Uh, thank you again, Mr. Galloway, for having me on. Uh, yes, the answer is, well, thanks to my work. Uh, yes, absolutely. I'm very well received. Uh, people are very pleased with the um, efforts that I've made uh, to go out and see for myself what is actually happening in, in specifically Donbass. But also, the I, I have to chastise those people that have voted about NATO starting wars for pushing that pr uh, Putin propaganda. Uh, the IMF was also accused recently with their uh, uh, optimistic forecast on the Russian economy of also pushing Putin propaganda. So you can see where I'm coming <laughs> from uh, there. Why why yeah. people receive me so well in Russia? I, I'll tell you why I ask. Uh, there's a new and on the face of it, utterly ludicrous spy scare in England right now. I don't know if you've caught up with that news, but three Bulgarians, one of whose email address was 007. Three Bulgarians running a bed and breakfast on the south coast of England who were famous for visiting their neighbors with cakes and pies who seem like, on the face of it, absolutely impeccable characters have now been arrested and are charged with espionage in the British courts, and it is scripple all over again. It is front page news. The Russians, with snow on their boots, with a vodka bottle peeking out of their pocket, with a dark beard and speaking with a funny accent, are under your bed, even if it's a bed and breakfast in the south coast of England. Do people in Moscow appreciate just how much the British don't like them? Oh, absolutely. The, well, in the sense that now more than ever, it's become more apparent that uh, what Putin was warning in the Munich uh, com uh, security conference speech, you know, with the British with the dagger behind their back, but the smile on their face, that's very much apparent. I, I was very much amused by that story, particularly that uh, one landlords testified that they ordered their super breakfast for seven pounds with four slices of bread whilst the British were struggling. <laughs> it was absolutely farcical <laughs> uh, across the board <laughs> with the super English breakfast. Uh, yeah, I I mean, that's Western media these days there, uh, but certainly perpetuating this sort of myth of the boogeyman. You may mention about Scripple. Yeah, I got those similar vibes there of look this way, but not that way. Yes, there's an ancient hatred, really. Uh, I've been telling people uh, here uh, just this day, actually. It predates Putin by a long way. It predates even the Bolsheviks, uh, and they're long dead. Uh, it predates the Russian Revolution. It's a hatred that goes back well it, deep into the 19th century and maybe even earlier than that. Uh, wh what do you think lies behind that ancient hatred by the British uh, of the Russians? I re honestly can't put my finger on it, even when I look through history. We have to acknowledge that it was the British that also attacked St. Petersburg along with the Swedes as well as part of the reason for Kronstadt and all the fortifications along there. Quite where this vitriol and all this hatred came from, I don't know. I, Britain also accused of stealing the Tsar's gold that he was in, that, you know, entrusted to them uh, back before the revolution and around that time. Uh, I really don't know. But the point is that I've often made uh, just earlier today is that has become very much apparent to the Russian people Putin's warnings over these years has very much come, the British being the, one of the most aggressive in all of this with arms supplies, with rhetoric, and as you've just alluded to in your monologue just there, about it doesn't match anymore. Whereas the British Empire used to have the teeth to, to back up and bully and get its way in the world, that was seceded to the US, and now the US is facing a similar fate. 
the political class just doesn't have the credibility nor the means to back up these big bold claims and uh, these threats that they make, particularly now towards uh, you know, places that they colonize, such as Africa as well. We're seeing Niger uh, rise up and Burkina Faso, along many others as well. It, it really beggars belief. But the point now is that it's becoming so visible to not just Africa, but across the rest of the world as well. The war isn't going well. And in fact, you could say the hatred, the propaganda... Uh, rises in inverse proportion uh, to the lack of success on the battlefield. Uh, it's uh, above evident now to all except the willfully blind uh, that the Ukrainians, backed by all of the NATO powers, uh, with all their weapons, all their money and all their propaganda, cannot prevail. As I've said from the beginning, it is not possible, as a matter of definition, for a nuclear superpower to be defeated in a conventional war in its next door neighbor, because that presupposes the destruction, the existential ruin of that nuclear superpower. And so the nuclear superpower, and America would be just the same if Mexico was uh, making war on it, or Canada making war on it, uh, the, the superpower can only increase the ante as necessary and reach for bigger and more fearsome weapons were it to be facing defeat in a conventional war. That truth is now self-evident. The Ukrainian forces, including some elite units, are refusing to go any more into that mincing machine. I have a feeling the tipping point in this war has been reached. You, reached. You're, you're, a, you're an ex-military man yourself. How does the battlefield look to you? Absolutely catastrophic. Uh, this much lauded counteroffensive has been an utter tragic a disgusting failure, really, particularly given how many Ukrainians were grabbed off the streets and thrown into the front lines, some with days of training, some with weeks. Uh, you know, the UK was very proud to say we gave these guys a, a half measure sort of training course and then just sent them straight into the meat grinder. I've had interviews with uh, DPR soldiers who have spoken with these prisoners of war. Uh, I have a report actually uh, right here. A Ukrainian document that was translated for me from the what they they didn't jokingly term uh, they termed it as the Dyadushka Battalion, the grandfather's battalion, because most of them were over forty five, they were around forty five, sixty five years of age. These were more senior men that had been mobilised. The losses that were reported are honestly catastrophic. Uh, those that were lucky to surrender. Just today, it's been reported that 500 men uh, surrendered, refused to fight in Zaporozhye direction, as they, as these battalions are down to about, uh, they've lost about 63 to 78 percent of their fighting strength. What really irks me, uh, we, we we talk a lot, kind of flippantly, about the corruption in Ukraine, but when I was told about the reporting of the dead is intentionally delayed by the commanders so that they can keep taking the salaries of these soldiers after their deaths so they don't report it up the chain of command and they most certainly do not report it to the families so they can keep cashing in on these paychecks which the this latest biden call to congress for 24 billion will no doubt end up funding it also gets worse than that when I hear reports from these prisoners of war that if they do not actually split their salaries with their commanders, they will be sent to these frontline storm, shock storm trooper battalions. So you have this choice. Do you want to be held in reserve or do you want to go to the front line? If you don't want to go to the front line, you've got to give us a proportion of your salary. I don't know how much that is. Uh, those are the reports that are consistently coming out from what I'm hearing of these uh, prisoners of war in Donbass, which is, as you can imagine, not just shocking, but heartbreaking to say the least, particularly with the work of the likes of journalist Isabella Lieberman, who is trying to match 
Ukrainian prisoners of war with their families in Ukraine? In normal circumstances, in a normal country, uh, this situation where soldiers are voting with their feet, either uh, across the lines in surrender, or in the case of the uh, Zaporozhye direction, literally refusing orders, refusing to fight uh, on the basis that uh, it's not a lack of courage. These soldiers have shown great courage over the last 500 days or so. It's, uh, it's a realization that they're fighting a losing battle and moreover, a battle for unworthy commanders and leaders and above all their allies. Uh, it's one thing to die. It's another thing to die for Joe Biden and Antony Blinken. In a normal country, this would lead to a change in political power. After all, Mr. Churchill uh, came to power on the back of a military debacle so small now that you look back on it, the Norway debacle. so massive and so bloody, it's not likely they're going to be able to hold on to power forever, don't you think, Mike? Uh, no, I agree. Forgive me, you did cut out just slightly there. Uh, you mentioned about Churchill's debacle in Norway and about uh, Biden holding into power. Uh, I, I would like to just state your first point about these men with their incredible courage. Uh, absolutely, I would agree. Even that with the Ukrainians faced with what is almost certain death. Uh, not to mention that the other reports being given, that this Western supplied equipment that's being given to them. I had I did an interview uh, with Russian a Russian soldier who'd picked up communications thanks to a Ukrainian dissident that claimed that tw uh, eight out of 12 AS-90 supplied by the UK were faulty to the point they were non-operational uh, upon delivery. So that's only four that were actually able to be used. One of them, including the firing button, was malfunctioning. These were in workshops, and of course, uh, Russian intelligence knew exactly where the workshops were. When I asked, what are you going to do with this information? The answer was, of course, we will destroy them. Today, we've heard of the 82nd Air Mobile Assault Brigade, which is one of the last reserves, 2,000 men, now being thrown into battle with Challenger tanks. So it's very likely that we shall see Challenger 2 tanks against the will of the British, or at least the initial orders of the British, to hold them back and not use them on the front line, it's quite likely that in the coming days we're going to see those burning on the battlefield. That's going to have a political uh, ramification. <laughs> uh, just I'm talking just politics. We know that this order was given because the ramification is going to have on the British military industrial complex to see this horrendous sight of Challenger 2s burning on the battlefield, potentially.